Welcome back to the All In Podcast. We're here in Franklin, Tennessee uh, for another episode. And I've got a great friend, a guy who's become a really good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Steve Afra, who is a private lender. I'll tell you a little bit about Steve uh, before I let him talk, but he's the managing partner of Investor Funding uh, and is responsible for the company's investor relations, strategic partnerships, secondary mortgage markets, and warehouse relationships. He has successfully funded the company's strategic, uh, executed the company's strategic vision, helped build one of the most premier specialized profit uh, lending firms in the nation. He's been an entrepreneur for over 25 years with a focus on residential lending and secondary mortgage markets, which we'll talk about. Prior to investor funding and investor, it starts with an N, not an I. Um, Steve founded M Bank, M B A N C, in 2014, become the nation's leading consumer direct non QM lender, funding over $3 billion in retail non QM loans. He's accredited with being one of the founders of the current non QM mortgage industry. Did you hear that? Steve has earned his Juris Doctorate degree from Turo Law School and a BA from Hofstra University. He's married to the beautiful Maria, and they have three children. They live here in Franklin, Tennessee. Steve, thanks for finally coming up. Thank buddy. you. Thank you for having me. So you just had some great news. Yep. Right. Uh, we just merged. Our company just merged with a dear friend of ours uh, from Lone House. Um, so what we'll be doing now, we we're not just going to be doing hard money loans or private money loans. We can do FHA, conventional, and non-QM loans. So we wow. have the whole gamut. Oh, damn it. Okay. And so this uh, helps you a lot of ways, right? Fantastic. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Just because, you know, we got a lot bigger. Tell you. We got a lot bigger. It diversifies us. It, it kind of uh, ensures that we get stabilization in the down market or an up market, right? And mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you, a lot of our investors that fix the properties and sell the properties, we could go after them and kind of market them and have them refer us as a as a lender or as a primary lender or you know a strategic partner for them so how can private lending help people how can private mo money lending help, help people yeah. um well primarily it's very difficult as you know to walk into a traditional bank and get any sort of financing right it's it's time consuming. A lot of people don't have the um, income wherewithal to get a loan, right? But what do I mean on by On paper. That? On paper, right? They're not showing. They're not, they're, not, they're not disclosing. And when they, when they go for a conventional type of loan, that's what they need to show. They need to show that they're earning money, which is naturally, that's what banks want to see or regular lenders want to see. Private money lending really focuses more on asset-based lending, meaning how much is the property worth, how much is it going to be worth, and what are we lending against the worth of the property, and um, more the borrower's history in terms of how many projects have they done, can we risk our money uh, you know, with this person, are they gonna be able to finish the project? This almost sounds like common sense underwriting. I don't know if that would apply, but- It's common it, sense underwriting. Yeah. It's common sense underwriting, but also we take the income out, right? right. We don't really care. Not, I shouldn't say we don't care. Obviously we care how much the guy's are earning, but we don't really look into that. I care more about what's my position in the property and right. God forbid this guy doesn't complete it, can I recoup my money? Right. Or on, on the other end, even if he doesn't go bad, is he gonna be profitable within that project? Mm -hmm. And so the type of client, talk about that, like who who out there is a type, is, is name a, it doesn't have to be a, a typical client. What's a typical client? A typical client is going to be somebody that's a fix and flipper, meaning they're buying distressed properties, they're fixing them up and they're reselling them, um, or it's going to be right now a ground up construction investor, right? Meaning that they're buying land, they're leveling it, uh, they're prepping it, and then they're building from, uh, you know, from ground up. Mm -hmm. um, or it's going to be somebody who is looking, um, they're purchasing a house that doesn't really need much work, but again, it's distressed. They, they see that they could make some sort of arbitrage in that property. Mm -hmm. Arbitrage meaning I could buy it at a discount and flip it quickly at, yeah. at, at a profit. Um, those would be really the, the type of people that we would take in on the private money side. But just for being around you, I do know that it, you do have end users. So in other words, somebody buying a home to live in, you do work with those clients as well. So 
right now, before the merger, uh, we were working with people only on investment properties doing DSCR loans. A DSCR loan is a debt coverage service, right? Meaning that the property itself, the rental that that they're collecting can cover the debt service, right? Okay. So what is the debt service? It would be the mortgage, the insurance, taxes. and the taxes, yep. right? So as long as the rent it covers the debt service of the property, we would be willing to lend it, you know, lend the money on a long-term basis. Right. That's the only um, product that we do on that side of the business, on the investor side of the business, that, that would be a 30-year product. On the private money side, the maximum that we would lend would be anywhere between 18 to 24 months, depending on the project. Because they're getting in and out. Yep. They're getting in and out, yeah. But somebody wants to come in that, you know, they're, they haven't been able to get bought, they want to buy a home, they own a business, um, you know, and they just can't buy, they can't I mean because the subprime market as we know, mm -hmm. you know, if you've seen the big short, all of that. So like that, yeah. that whole market went away. I mean, literally we, you and I know people that yeah. lost their countrywide BC, yeah. all of the Saxon mm -hmm. mortgage and all these yeah. companies, they just evaporated. Yes. And so for the that part. made, for the most part, yeah. this made an opportunity for someone like yourself to come in and fill a need. So back history, you're right. On the private money side, um, and we both know we, were, we went through it, like you said, in 2008, uh, two senators, not too smart, but Dodd and Frank, right? They, they, put, they came together not knowing anything about the mortgage business, mm -hmm. and they put some rules and restrictions around the mortgage business. We can speak freely here, by the way. This, uh, <laughs> is, a, this is a PG-13. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, two idiots. Uh, <laughs> They kind of, you know, messed things up, fucked things up, you know, fucked it up. And um, they, they, you know, they put restrictions around the lending business that had nothing to do or very little to do with why the meltdown happened, right? They didn't understand why it happened, but then they decided to put restrictions around and fences around the lending business. And one of them was that, any sort of loan that is tied to owner-occupied properties has to have a QM portion to it, right? Which it has to tie in to some sort of income. Yeah, describe what QM means. Qualifying mortgage. Right. So a QM mortgage would be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, yeah. or your type of loan mm -hmm. that, that you do in your company. All in one loan. All in one loan, mm -hmm. where you're, you're, you, you, there has to be an income component. You're, mm -hmm. you're checking their income, you're making sure that the income can cover or there's some sort of debt, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, debt to income ratio, mm -hmm. right? Um, that would be a qualifying mortgage. Now, once they put that on, and this is what I like to tell people because people like to say, you know, hard, well, hard money and private money is the same. No, that's when things kind of split. Prior to 2008 and everything with Dodd-Frank, hard money lenders is what we would describe them, would be able to do both. They would be able to get somebody that's in distress, like you're saying, maybe they missed the payment, maybe they... You know, there was a death in the family, God forbid, or something got fucked up. You know, uh, someone died, something happened. They would be able to go to a private money guy, and the private money guy would be able to bail them out, yeah. right? And even if they didn't have the requisite income, they'd be able to do that. Yeah. So that was called a hard money loan because it was based on some sort of hardship or something going on. Things changed. So ever since Dot Frank came into play, Private money lenders like us cannot lend money to anyone that's in a primary residence. Okay. We can only do non-primary -prim residence okay. properties, so only non-owner-occupied properties. So are you getting into credit scores, and what play, what role do they play Well, in your world? In my world, in any sort of lending world, right? So the thing is, the private money business was very localized at one point. What do I mean by that? The private money was... In every section, let's say, I know you grew up here in Franklin, there would be a couple of doctors that got together or business guys that pulled together two, three million dollars. And, you know, they knew the area really well. And an investor wanted some money. You would say, hey, go down to, you know, Dr. Charlie and maybe he'll give you the money. Right. Right. But 
also Dr. Charlie knew the streets, knew the areas, knew everything that happened in the area. So he really didn't care about credit scores or anything mm -hmm. like that. So he would just basically lend because that was his neighborhood. Things have changed. I'm lending in 44 different states, right? I don't know the markets in every state that I lend it's in. It's impossible. It's impossible. I'm not localized, right? And I don't know, you know, I'm not Dr. Charlie, so I don't know the history of the people that live within that particular town or be able to ask them questions. Hey, you know, is is uh, Johnny a is good guy? Is he going to be good for it? Is he going to be good? Is, you know, if I give him some money, is he going to pay me back? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not localized, right? Yeah. But that's how it used to be. The difference now is just like any other lending, the only way I know if Johnny's going to pay me back is is how is he paying everybody else? Right. And that's where credit score comes in. If the guy is a, a shitbag and he's not paying anyone back, what's the chances I'm special? I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be special. And unfortunately, yeah. even in my business where you would think credit score doesn't play into it, every time pretty much I've taken a chance with someone with a shitty score, it hasn't turned out to be really well. So you learned. I learned, yeah. you know, 32 years I've learned, right, right? right? You learn a few things. Yeah. So how do you determine terms for these clients? Like rates, terms, how do you determine that when you're underwriting a file? Risk to benefit, yeah. right? So obviously if somebody has um, a great history, right? Yeah. They've done 10 projects and they've killed it and if they're repeat customers, they're, you know, the risk to lend to them is going to be less, so they're going to get better terms. If it's somebody who's done one or two properties and I, we don't really know them, the rates are going to be a little bit high um, and the points are going to be a little bit high. Also, we really don't let them get over their head, right? There, there's so many times I get a guy that's trying to get into the game. He's done one property, and then the next thing you know, he wants to take on something with heavy construction. And then he's arguing with me of why I should lend him money. Right. I tell him, listen, you want to take the risk? You can take the risk, but I'm telling you not to because you just got into the game. Right. When you get involved in heavy construction projects, there's so many things that could go fucking south that – you know, you're not aware of, right. and you don't have the history to be able to deal with the things that go south real fast in heavy construction projects, right? right. So, you know, so when it comes to that, we're, it's common sense underwriting, like you said, like the way that we used to lend, you, you kind of have to put all the factors in there and say, how long has, you know, what types of projects has this guy done, you know? How long we, are we going to be committed to this? Is it going to be a project that's three, four months or six to 12 months? We try not to really go heavy or lend to people with very light history yep. and, and go long on them. We, we'll rather them get a couple of deals under their belt and, and then, you know, come back to us and then we'll, we'll lend on the, on the heavier Do stuff. Do you find that most people listen? No. They don't? No. It's just like, you know, it's the funny thing is, as I get older, I realize that we don't ever change. <laughs> we're the same people, right? It's the same kids that we grew up with that were just dumb as dirt. They just got older yeah. and they just don't listen, right? And that's just a consumer. You can tell them till you're blue in the face. And unfortunately, what happens is, you know, in human nature, unless you make the mistake yourself, right? Yeah. You really don't learn the, learn the lesson. The thing is, I have 32 years of experience and I tell them, you want to learn from the mistake? You could learn from the mistake, but I'm not coming for the ride, right? Meaning I won't lend you the money so you could learn the mistake because I already know you're going to make the mistake. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's desperation. A lot of times people, I mean, you get in a hard spot. I mean, there's movies about, yeah. I mean, that's, these are stories that, you know, they yeah. write movies and books about it. Like people are in desperate times. They'll do desperate things. And they want to get out of yeah. their skis. You got somebody that's, that's like in the business is saying you shouldn't do this. Yeah. And then they still want to push forward. Maybe they drop you. They go somewhere else. They're trying, they're still trying to, you It's know. two things. I think you're right. The first thing is desperation, but I think desperation 
can you could put an excuse around that and say, you know what, the guy had to do what he had to do, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> the biggest thing, my, my pet peeve, is more greed, right? Mm -hmm. It's they get greedy, and mm -hmm. it's like, well, I don't want to hit base hits. Well, you know what? It's like anything in life. You, gotta you, work you know, for it. you have to work for the you know the home runs, and you have to work for the you know triples. You're not you know you're you're not you're not getting grand slams We've right lost off the bat today. Yeah, no, no one has patience because you know you have kids. What's happening? Where me and you had to wait yeah, they every that. Saturday morning for cartoons. They're getting the same <laughs> cartoons. I want to see this. Right. Done. It's I want to see that. Great example. I, I want to see a movie, right? right. I, t you know, I tell my kids, I say, my Netflix was my mother dropping me and my cousin Mike off at the movie theater at 1030 in the morning, right? And then we would movie hop right. <laughs> from 1030 till nine o'clock at night. Is this, a, watch. is this in Long Island? Yeah, in Long Island. From, you know, and, and, but the funny thing is, you know, movies didn't come out that fast. So every yeah. weekend we would watch the same five movies <laughs> <laughs> right. from 10 o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Yeah. But that was, that was Netflix wow. on Sunday. Wow. Wow. So these people come to you. Um, what's like the process for the like, you know, from application to funding, because it's, I want to say it's shorter time. It's like shorter. You get the, that's the, that's the pot. That's one of the biggest things I think one when you're things. working yeah. in this realm yeah. is the speed. Yeah. So again, as you know, it's when people are buying investment properties or any sort of situation in any business that um, they're buying something undervalued, usually there's a caveat to that mm -hmm. and you hit it on the head there's some sort of desperation or something going on on the sale side. And whoever acts fastest is going to be able to pick up that arbitrage, right? Yeah. So speed is a big part of that game. The difference between us, like I said, is since we're not really looking into the income portion of the property and we only really care about the guy's history and, and we're blending on the asset, more than the borrower, uh, we're able to close these deals as fast as 72 hours if there's an appraisal in place already and the title work is done. Wow. And then, but on average, we're probably seven to 10 business days. So seven to 10 business days, people have their funding. They're people able to move forward with the project. They're able to so move forward. That's huge. And that's, but that's, again, that's more on the fix and flip side. On the ground up construction side, it's a little bit more work. I would say it's about two weeks, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, I, I want someone to tell me who, these guys that are builders that have gone into a bank and gotten in a ground up construction loan if they got it in two weeks. Never. Yeah, it's, no. You know, they're lucky if they got it in two months. Sure. Sure. So we t what are some like common mistakes that people do? I mean, when they're, I mean, they're getting out over their skis. You talked about that a little bit. Um, common mistakes. Yeah. They, get, they, they get greedy. Greedy. So you greedy. got the do opposite ends of the spectrum. You got the, uh, the people that are just desperate. Yeah. Um, they need the money. Then yeah. you got somebody that's kind of doing well, but they want to do, they want to go from first to, th to home. Yes. Immediately. Yeah. And so that's where you got to say, no, no, no. So sometimes yeah. you're, I mean, you have to, do you have to say no a lot? I say, I say more no. More than off, more often I than say, not. I say no more often than I say yes. Right. But that's what keeps me in business and right. profitable. Right. Sure. It's the guys, it's my competition. It's guys that get in that they're just chomping at the bit. Right. Oh. Right. Right. Whatever Steve's doing, I got to go take his. Right. Take mine. Whatever I leave on the table, God bless you. <laughs> take all of it. Take all right? of it. I don't want Why? There was a reason I walked away from that. There's a reason. And if you're dumb enough to go after the business that I give up, God bless you. Because I don't need to do anything else. You're going right. to put yourself out of business quicker than I could put you out of business. Right? But here's, here's another thing. The other biggest mistake that they make is like we talked about it, people are not patient. And I tell everybody, any anything you wanna do in life, you've gotta pay your dues, right? You've gotta take, you got, you know, I mean, think about you, you had to work for somebody, you had to learn the game, right? And the people that are trying to get into the business, and I tell them, I can't lend to you if you don't have any experience. And they get upset, but I tell them, this is twofold. One thing, I'm protecting my money, but you have to know I'm protecting your money, right? Right? You can't look at it like, oh, shocks. This guy's not lending me money. You should say, hmm. I should listen to this guy. He knows something. Right. And I tell him, 
as much as I want to protect me, I want to protect you, right? Yeah. And if I'm protecting me and I'm telling you, no, 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 right. or if I'm giving you advice, then what do I tell them? You're not ready. You've never done a flip. There's 10,000 things that could go wrong. It's not, you know, they go, they're taking classes, God bless them, from Grant Cardone, and, and Grant's selling them this crazy shit because he's got to make the money, right? And I tell him, this is not fucking Grant's world. It's not. You know, he's telling you because he's got to sell himself. Right. The reality of the game is you have to get some sort of mentorship from somebody. Find somebody in the market that you're in, right? And ask them, say, hey, I'll put up all the money. Yeah. Right? I'll do everything. And I, I, I have one of, one of my mentors in life, right? This kid that came to me, I, I did that for him and I hooked him up with somebody and he's so ultra successful right now. He's just, you know, and what did I tell him? Same thing. I said, you want to be a flipper, go out there and you, you're in LA. Here's the name of this guy. And I called the guy up and his name's Todd. And I said, Todd, I have this kid, he wants to do it. And you know what he told me? He goes, there's no way, I don't have time. I said, don't you want to pass on some sort of legacy? Like, mm -hmm. don't you just, you know, it's more than time. Yeah. Help this kid, right? right. Now, there are 120 projects in together. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Todd yesterday, and he said, one of the biggest blessings you gave me was... This introduction. Dove. Yeah. Was this introduction because Todd was also overwhelmed. And now they're working together and this is a good fit. And it's a good fit. But but what was the advice I gave? I said to Dove and he took it. I said, Don't be greedy. He's not gonna come invest with you. You put up the money and what you need from him, and you're going to share the profits. Yeah. What you need from him is his experience, right? right. And that's even. You come up with the money, yeah. he comes up with the experience. That's you know, you just saved yourself fifteen years of, of headaches that this guy went through and don't get greedy. And now that they've been married for three years and, and they're happy as, you know, pig and shit. They're just, they're, they, they, they love it. And it all comes back around to this word that we use all the time. It sounds so as cliche, but it's, we're talking about relationships, relationships. It's we're, like, that's yeah, everything. That's everything in life. It's, relationship with God, yeah, relationship with your wife, but 100%. in business and your kids, pe right? People want to jump ahead. And so I get so many questions in my DMs about like, Hey, I'm 22. I live in New York city. I live in New Jersey, wherever in, in America. And I want to start investing. I've got the, yeah. you know, I've got a couple of things and mm -hmm. what do I do? And so <clears throat> I can't do a lot from here. Right. But what I can say is like in your local area, this is just what you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, go to some local investor meetups. So like here, Real Estate Investors Network, um, you go and this is, they're growing. So you just find those. And the thing is, I'll try to say, find it on Facebook. You got to find some of these kids are not on Facebook. Yeah. So you find it. Where do I YouTube, find that? I'm not on Facebook yeah, I'm 22. Yeah. <laughs> but dude, Dick, ask your mom, so ask your mom to get, log on to Facebook yeah. for you. But yeah. like, you know, you've got to find these groups and go to these meetups and you're going to meet people who actually want to help. Yeah. You, yes. because they will part yeah. now. You've got to bring something to the table, yeah. uh, whether it's finding the deal, bringing the funding. Um, but it's just like anything, yeah. man. Like, you know, you've got somebody comes along. You know, what's that? St like, you hear people like, how do you learn something? You, you know, instead of going to college, Jimmy, why don't you, uh, you've heard the person. Well, I just said, I'm going to call this guy and I'm just going to do whatever he wants me to do. And I'll mm. work for free for yeah. you. Well, that's it. Yeah. Like you're on to something there. That's right. You're doing that. That's right. Because well, what is what? Because why? Because the experience that you get from that. Listen, I, I, you know, I mean, what is Dove like? What what would he trade for that? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. I, I, you know, the, the, look, I try to tell people it's almost like a blacksmith back in the day. Yeah. It's like trying to go and forge knives and swords and shit, right? Yeah. But never working so what did these blacksmiths have they always had the the, the apprentice yeah, yeah the apprentices right and these apprentices used to spend two years five years ten years learning the craft the art right i was fortunate enough and you know my wife knows i had some great mentors in my life but my mentors the way that they forged me and the rest of the people that i grew up with that would never fly today Right. Right. Yeah. Because the abuse that I used to take. And, and, you know, the funny thing is, I just went met one of my mentors after 30 years I hadn't seen him. 
Okay. I had lunch with him at Joe's Crab House in, in Miami. And we sat there and we spoke for about two hours. And he turned to me at the end. He said, I'm sorry if I was too harsh on you. Mm. And I turned to him. I said, Eric, are you crazy? Mm. So I'm not a snowflake, man. The greatest thing you did for me was being that harsh on me, making me do things that were so uncomfortable where 50% of the time I, I would say to myself, I can't do this shit. There's no fucking way. I got I to gotta get out of here, right? Yeah. But then you were pot committed, right? You're like, well, I spent this much time. What am I going to do? But today... It's just a different story, and and I and I and I feel for the the new breed of kids where it's just become the norm. Like you said, I want everything yesterday, and nothing good gets done without the time. It's almost like a diamond. I, I try to tell my own kids, how do you get that diamond? Right, that coal has to be so compressed for such a long period of time that it's no longer a coal, right? Yeah, yeah. That's useless. I mean, how much is your coal worth? Not mm -hmm. worth the price of the crap under your feet right mm -hmm. but how much is the diamond worth yeah but what happened to that diamond there was so much pressure on it there was so much time spent on that thing that when it came out it became a diamond but what you see today and this this dichotomy it's like a, a friend of mine was asking why are there so many like successful ultra successful people and when we were growing up everybody was kind of even keeled and we were just fighting each other i said you know what because the field is no longer even. We were all a bunch of sharks. Yeah. And then there would sometimes be a megalodon, right, mm -hmm. coming out and killing us, right? Yeah. But that was an anomaly. But now you have these sharks that are just dealing with, you know, fish, little fish, goldfish, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's, it's a different game. And now the guys that are coming out, that are the sharks that get trained by right fathers and mothers, right? right. Let's just say that, God forbid, we can't even say, oh, parent, we have to say in these right. days, right? right? But they have, I'm not gonna say parent. They have the right mother, they have the right father. These people, those kids are coming out and they're becoming the Elon Musks, right? They're becoming these ultra successful people because they were built right, they were trained right. Yeah, and they're getting the opportunity because there is a competition. There you go. We're the last of the Mohicans. These guys, you know, you you raise your kids right, and, and you teach them work ethic. They're going to kill it. Yeah. <clears throat> but people aren't even. Um, you name anyone who's really successful, and they whether it be, you know, uh, Bezos, uh, any of these people, uh, Steve Jobs. They they started from like their garage. And you have to hear uh, the backstory. Of you have to hear the backstory, uh, and you like not just hear it. You have to feel that you have to know yeah. that like, that is time. And 100%. I think things are so truncated. People just say they look at the story because they've already lived it. And so all they're doing is hearing the story and seeing the story. And they see the old pictures of yeah. Bezos there in his, you know, in his little office yeah. with pegboard or whatever. Yeah. But that was a long time. It was a long time. It's a long time. We're talking about long, 99 or something like that when yeah. he started this thing. Yeah. So selling he, books. You that's what he was selling. Yeah. And I think because the story's short, yeah. They think that people think that they can just go fast, fast, fast. Right. And it's just, yeah. it's, I mean, and there's a beauty in the process. I mean, who is the most successful football coach now? We, we you don't, I don't even, we haven't Bill, Bill Belichick or, or in college Saban. Yes, yeah, Saban. In the, in the same cloth, but yeah. it's all about, they, they have the buy in, they have their team buy into the system, the, the process. Yes. Like you have to enjoy yeah. the process, fall in love with the process and then the outcome. Yes. So somehow, and, and which new coach, which new coach is building that in? Who? Dion Sanders. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? Oh, I love him. Right? Yeah. yeah. But he's, he's just like you're saying. So great point. He just the other day, I saw his interview and uh, he says, <clears throat> Yeah, you have to earn your number. Yeah. Yeah. These these linemen that are wanting number three. Yeah. You know, they're 300 pounds and yeah. they want to, you know, hey, I want to be number two. Yeah. Yeah. Now I got people, I don't have a D-back that yeah. has, you know, my, I can't have, you know, those numbers are reserved yeah. for, for my defensive yeah. backs or whatever. You got to earn your number. Earn he it. said, I'm old school. Yeah. Well, what he means by that is old school guy. Just so you know, when they say old school, it doesn't mean he's old. It means he, he, he it's, it's, there's a word, it's called work. That's what he's talking about. Work ethic. Work. <laughs> right, work. work. And so people think Dion, um, you know, yeah, he, he, he's an athlete and now he's born with certain gifts, but like you think about Jordan and Kobe, Kobe was good 
Yeah, he was, yeah, he was tall, six, eight, yeah. whatever. But why was he great? Because he got to the gym way before yeah. everybody else. Michael got to the gym way before that. But, and by the way, what, who was Kobe calling at three in the morning? Jordan. Michael. Yeah. To yeah. say, hey, and so now what do you see? You see, I love it when they show this overlay where they'll show the screen and they'll show the exact same move that Kobe got from Jordan, yeah. like the exact same turnaround, the exact same fadeaway, the exact same move to the left or the right. And so then when they would play one another, you know, they're into it. But then every now and then that face comes out like they're smiling yeah. because it's almost like they're playing, it's you know, each you other. Know, yeah. Right. So this is, this is the greatest thing, right? So you're saying that's a doubt. So he was Kobe's hero. Jordan was Kobe's hero, right? He emulated him. The thing is, you also have to decide, like, who are you going to emulate, right. right? And it has to kind of link up to what you're trying to do in life mm -hmm. as well. So, again, I go back to my lunch meeting. I sat down with, with the guy I always emulated, and I told him, I said, Eric, I emulated you, and you were my hero. And why that was, was because he was one of the hardest working people I had ever met. Going to the office, he was always there. The earliest. I mean, I don't think anyone ever beat this guy in. And then no one ever beat him out. Yeah. You know, but the, to, to your, what you're saying, it was always, he was the envy of the town, but no one was willing to put in the work, right? Yeah. And the, and what it took. And, you know, I know you're a Dodger fan, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but if but I, still love, I, still follow, I still love the Yankees. Okay. I love the lore of the Yankees. Okay. You're smart. You know, my top 10 favorite players definitely have three or four Yankees. Okay. So did you see the whole story of Derek Jeter? Oh, he's my favorite player okay. of all time. Okay. So there you go. So, Do I get a pass now? You got a pass. Afra? Okay. So <laughs> the captain. What, 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 the captain. What, what would he say? What would his friends say? Every time they go and try and pick him up, what was he doing? It working, hitting balls. Yeah, right. Tony Gwynn. He wouldn't. He would. Yeah. And he, and he. But he would not leave. He couldn't leave until he hit those balls and did what he had to do, and then he would go out. Right. And it, it comes down to he was not great when he no, came into the league. He no, was he wasn't. not great. No, when you he look wasn't. at, he was not great. No. He got. No. He got that job. He. It was just. He they wasn't won. great. He wasn't great. Nope. All of a sudden, he's now in yeah. the starting yeah. lineup in the yeah. end. But like, he still. But it was the work. It was the mindset. It was the mindset and the work, right? And, and he didn't. Quit. And the manifestation, right? So the other thing is, a lot of these new kids, they're picking up the books like The Secret, and ooh, let me manifest. Uh, believe me, I'm one of the first people to tell you meditation is key. Manifestation is key. <laughs> but. I can't sit in my fucking you know basement and say, oh, Speak I'm going to be a millionaire and meditate on it and not do shit and expect it to come. It doesn't come. Right. They're missing the, the third and most important element, which yeah. is now you got to go out there. Yeah. And you got to go and you have to do it so that it comes to you, right? If you're sitting dormant, what's, what's going to happen, right? It's never going to happen. So one of my other mentors in life, this guy, Sammy Cohen, my, one of my father's partners, who's ultra successful. I sat with him and he was, you know, he, he said something so important. He, he, you know, he took a drop of water and he was saying about work ethic and why you have to go spend time, right? And you have to spread yourself out. And he took a drop of water and he put it on the table. He was this drop of water. Now, what's the chances of a bug or, or a mosquito landing on it? And if the mosquito is chance, if it's luck, Right, if it's if that is your your you know that break, right? What's the chances of that landing on this? I said very little. Then he took the same drop of water. He didn't add to it, and then he spread it around the table, right? And the table that mass was wet. He said, "Now that's the same drop of water. What's the chances of that mosquito landing on that mass that I just spread that same drop out?" I said, "A lot greater." He said, "So that's the point." You can't sit dormant like a drop. You got to go out there, spread your thing out, that. so that that chance, that luck is going to hit you, right? And, and the more surface area you have in life, and how you expand your surface area is, you get up in the morning and you do shit. Yeah, you do things from the morning to you know the 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 time that. It's time to finish or, or go and, and be a dad or, or, or be a husband or something like that. You know, but look, I'll sit down just like you. My phone will be ringing nonstop with business opportunities, right? 
I could sit down with a new person that just got into the game and they think that it's by chance. And what I try to tell them is that is 32 years of work and surface yeah. area that this phone is going off nonstop. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's because I put the work in for 32 years. Yeah. Did so much stuff that thank God, and I've treated people so well in my life, even though when they didn't even fucking deserve it, right? And there's plenty of people that I know. But at the end of the day, even those bastards that abused me, that hurt me, they can't say anything bad about me. And that's important. And if it ever came down to it, you know who could they, they could trust if they had to come back around? Me. Yeah. Even though they betrayed me, they know they betrayed me, they screwed me, but I'm still that one person that they know that they could trust and come back to. I love it. How do people work with you, Steve? Um, they could get in touch with me via text or they could email me. What's your email address? It's steve at investorfunding.com. So investor is no I. No I. Just starts with an N. Investorfunding.com. Right right, steve right at investorfunding.com. Yep. Uh, follow you on, on Instagram. It's on investor. Instagram. It's, uh, it's Afra Steve on Instagram. On his, Afra Steve on Instagram. Yeah. So thanks for coming, man. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it, my so brother. Much, yeah, Thank love you. you. So much. See you. Till next time, guys. We'll see you back here, same time, same place. See you.